learning workshop. It, is in, it involves both some, there's a lot of me talking, and I'm going to be talking very fast, because this was meant to be longer, um, but also there's some JavaScript examples, while you get the whole copying thing done, and also quite a lot of Python stuff. Now the Python stuff is all done using a Jupyter notebooks, but to install Jupyter with all the deep learning stuff is pretty tricky, that's why I've distributed a virtual machine, so you can all play with this along with the thing. And there's, there's other stuff on the drive, but in the virtual machine already, pre-trained networks, everything, there's a lot of fun in there. Um, if you open within your the things you've done, you've copied, there's a presentations folder. If you open index.html, you'll get a screen like this. And this has got the links to the different, uh, there's a link to the presentation, and there are links to the JavaScript examples and what to do with the virtual box. But let's not leap ahead. Let me start with the deep learning book. Oh. Let me start with this one. Okay, so I'm, um, I'm Martin. I moved here um, back in September 2013. I have a background. Firstly, I did a PhD in machine intelligence a long time ago. Um, I've been doing a bit of startups and quite a lot of finance. But I decided that I should really be having fun rather than just doing finance. So um, I spent 2014 doing machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing, played with some robots and drones, I did a lot of meetups. But since 2015, I've had kind of a serious project with a local company here doing natural language processing and deep learning for a living. Um, there will be kind of, if you want to do that for a living, then come talk to me. Anyway. So, deep learning, what, I guess the question is, what's this all about? What can we do with deep learning right now? So, at the moment, deep learning is used for speech recognition, uh, language translation, various vision tasks, automatic captioning, and reinforcement learning. It's been in the news, and we're going to have a talk about how all of this works. We're going to see real examples of, hopefully, on your own machines of this working. So... Okay, so here's a speech recognition. This deep learning stuff used to be kind of wild and wacky. Speech recognition is probably on your phone already. Um, back in 2012, Google started using it with the recognition in the cloud. Um, but now it's on every phone since 2014. Um, so so you, the phone is recognizing speech locally. And this is a deep neural network. Translation. Google has a kind of an interesting thing where you can point your camera at foreign words and it will translate it in like an, an AR kind of thing. It will translate it on the fly and show you the words in context on the page. This is kind of crazy, but it works and it's available. House numbers. So part of deep learning is huge amounts of data. And what Google have been doing with their recaptures challenging you to find the numbers in pictures was gathering a huge human data set of what humans read. Both they were checking that they were human with one of the numbers and the other number was finding out what they thought about the other numbers. So um, they can now do this um, better than humans can because they can know exactly the error rates of humans because they can get people to disagree with each other. All trying to be human, you find out how many people disagree, you get a percentage of error rate this thing's better than humans now. ImageNet. We'll talk a bit more about ImageNet going forwards, but um, this thing can recognize um, photos and objects in images. Um, and this, this ImageNet competition has given rise to a huge amount of in investment and uh, excellent stuff in deep networks. Captioning. So by reading the captions and labels that everyone has put on their Flickr images or their Google um, drives, they can now label what's in images fairly accurately. If you give it, if you put an unknown image into one of your Google folders, it will come up with an image about, or will label it hopefully correctly. Um, if you've got this on your drive and you, you can follow this along in the presentation, you can have a look at some of these labels. Now, on the left-hand side, pretty good. So you've got a, a person riding a motorcycle on a dirt road. Pretty accurate. Um, then it gets less accurate. Next column over is two dogs play in the grass. It's three dogs playing in the grass. Okay. Next one is a 
skateboarder does a trick. Well, this is a motorcyclist. Uh, so that's pretty, that's fairly wrong. And then there's another very wrong thing, is a dog jumping to catch a frisbee. That dog is not jumping, there's no frisbee, it's confused. So this is, the, this is kind of at the tip of what people are doing with this stuff, towards uh, photos and images. Um, then people are starting to look... Google started to have some fun with reinforcement learning. And what they, their major uh, nature paper had a thing where they learned to play Atari games. So here they would learn to play Space Invaders, essentially by, have, by giving the computer pictures of the screen of Space Invaders and, a, and four buttons to press, four or five buttons to press, and just, just tell it the score that it was receiving along the way. And this thing, in about two hours, can learn to play it kind of as well as a human. It's, it gets pretty good, and, which is interesting. Um, but then they moved on to Go. So this was kind of the major news story, like in AI terms this year, I guess, so far. Um, beating Lee Sedol, which was very cool. They're going to do another one um, later this year, where there's a Chinese player who is potentially better. On the other hand, they didn't switch the self-learning off, so it may be a challenge. Um, so we'll talk about the reinforcement learning. And in fact, the reinforcement learning is something where we have a, um, an actual module, like an advanced module, which we'll talk about at length later on. So this whole talk is basically is meant to be an hour and a half. Um, in, it will divide roughly into three sections. So first half hour is going to be this little piece of introduction and some JavaScript examples. The second half an hour is going to be the the Theano and the Python environment for doing this deep learning. And the last half hour is going to be reinforcement learning, which I've got a nice little example. So one thing which I just should preface the whole thing is the AI effect. This whole AI field is exploding, but as soon as it's done, people will say, well, that was pretty easy. I mean, Go. Go is only a game, right? It's hardly interesting once the computer can do it. I mean, before the computer could do it, they were saying, well, you know, Go is like the pinnacle game in the... In the um, for humans, um, and the computers will never do it, it's too intuitive. Uh, now it's kind of a mechanical process. Um, hopefully, there won't be too many unemployed Go masters, but the AI effect is a real thing, and it kind of artificial intelligence along the way has given us a lot of, a lot of cool stuff to do, but it, as soon as it becomes doable, it's not AI anymore, really. Um, so that's kind of a, a bugbear for the field. So, let us start with the very, very basics. And the interesting thing for neural networks is this has been going on since the 80s or 90s or even before. The idea was let's try and do computation like the brain does. And a lot of people are very uncomfortable. A lot of reporters like to report about this is a brain-like computer. And a lot of the scientists are saying, well, it's not really much like the brain at all because... Basically, we use matrix multiplies, and a lot of them. Um, this is not how the brain works at all. Um, the model, the idea of the connectivity may be the same, but the actual mathematics is completely alien. So here is a picture of what, what we call a single neuron. And I'm sorry this is going to... Many people have seen this before, but just so everyone's on the same page. Basically, on this diagram, we've got the input coming in at the bottom which is the x1, x2, x3. There are some weights, and then there's a... The neuron is the thing in the middle, which sums up all the weights. And then the output of the neuron... or sums up all the inputs times the weights. The output of the neuron is just um, some kind of non-linearity. Now, what people have discovered... Um, the, people used to be really worried about whether this is a tan function or a logistic function, what kind of nonlinearity it was. People have discovered that just taking the positive only part of the answer is good enough. It doesn't really matter that you can't differentiate it or anything. This, this simplifies the whole uh, requirement for mathematics enormously. You're just doing a matrix multiply and then taking everything above zero. And if you want to change the function you're doing of x... You just need to change the Ws. So what you can then do 
is you can then say, well, let's have, still have some x's at the bottoms and have some outputs that we want at the top with some intermediate units. Now, these intermediate units, we don't actually have any data about what they should be. We know what the output should be if we're doing um, supervised learning. We know what the inputs are, for, but we don't actually know what the representation in the middle is. So this is another thing which caught everyone up in the 80s and 90s, is that how do you train these hidden units? Um, and it turns out it's quite doable. Um, you just have to use brute force, basically. So supervised learning, which I mentioned before, is you pick a training case. Say this is x to some target. Then you say, well, what does x actually give me? And then you make it so that the, the, the weight, you change the weights so that what it gives you is slightly nearer what you wanted. So suppose I have a picture of a cat. So I start at the top. I pick a picture of a cat. I know it's a cat. It's a picture of a cat. But if I look at the output of my whole neural network, it says dog. Now, this is wrong. So what I do is I change the weights in the neural network so that it's slightly more cattish than before. And then I go on to other examples. Millions of examples. Hundreds of millions of examples. And once I've done that a lot of times, eventually this thing learns that cat is a cat. Um, the surprising thing is this really works. And, and it never used to work, but now we've got hundreds of millions of images which you can download. The internet is spreading data like crazy. Um, people have got very fast machines and GPUs. Um, you can do an awful lot of processing. And that is the, kind of the secret source. So here's a, just the, the main idea of this gradient descent. When I said let's move the weight so it gets slightly closer to the right answer, basically you can take a gradient of your error function and say I want to move in the direction which makes my error less. And so quite how you work out the gradient of this horrendously complicated, well, you can work out the gradient of a signal neuron pretty easily. It's a linear function. When you've got multiple layers, you might have got several routes through each weight, so it becomes a bit more challenging. And you'll see that people start to do more and more complicated things. So um, finding the gradients is, is not so easy, um, but gradient descent is what people do. So now we're getting to the time where we can actually do something. So what I want to do is to train a little neural network, and we're going to play with how wide the layers are and how deep the network is, and we're going to use stochastic gradient descent. So if you now go to your presentation folder and you have a look at this, it's the second page of your little presentation thing here, you'll see the JavaScript example painting. Does, is anyone utterly confused by this? <laughs> if you're utterly confused, Ask your neighbor. Okay. There is a thing called painting here. If you click on that, you'll get to this example. If you're not connected, or if you don't have a laptop, sorry, if you don't have a laptop, you're stuffed. If you do have a laptop but haven't got VirtualBox anything installed or you couldn't copy anything, you can go to the web and look at this convnetjs.com. And what we're going for is there's a cat example, or there's a picture, a fuzzy picture of a cat, because that's what we're going to be learning about. So if we go into this painting example, you'll see, and hopefully people are seeing this, and maybe it's time for a demo. Excuse, so excuse me. Let me go. This thing. Ah, okay. So here, here is my here's my version. This is demo. You can see that gradually this thing, sorry, what this network is doing, and you can see that the network is defined in this box at the top. There's a bunch, this is an array, this is JavaScript, so there's an array of layers, and we say there's an input layer, then a fully connected layer, then an output layer. And that's all, that's all there is. There's a very simple one-layer network. And then we're just training this as best we can to produce the colors of the picture of the cat. Now, the thing is, there's only four, four neurons, and what you'll see is it's trying to fit four lines as best it can to fit the image of this cat. And it's not going to, obviously you can't draw that picture of the cat with four lines. So, so let's try something a bit bigger. Let's go with 12 neurons and reload. 
So, what, sorry, when, when I changed the box on the left, it's updated the code in the top. So it's now you can see it's a tw number of neurons is 12 in the third line. So here we've got, um, this is 12 lines trying to approximate this cat. Now, the problem here is it doesn't really have any concept of roundness or eyes. I mean, it, the, 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 there are higher level features of this cat that you can't approximate if you're just trying to draw lines on it. Um, even if we move up to 48 neurons. Let's try again. So at some point my laptop will die. Okay, so 48, we're getting quite a lot of lines we can draw. But basically, you can see some of the, the catness coming out. But basically, every time it draws a line, it's then going to have to cancel out the bits which don't match, and it's got to kind of fit this up. So here we've got 48 neurons, and it's going to have a tough time, for obvious reasons. But if we say, let's instead, on the, this is the fourth one down, two layers of 24 neurons, so now we've got different code, and we restart. Now it's, now, it's got, now it's got the chance to form some kind of intermediate useful feature. Like, am I, am I in the lower half of the picture? In which case, do this. And you'll see it gradually fixing up something a bit more like a cat. So it's got a, like a two-step decision it can make. And is this good getting somewhere? So it's also training some internal representation um, and we don't really know what the internal representation means. We haven't looked at that yet. So, um, but it's, it's, get, it's doing a better job, plain, well, to me, it's plainly doing a better job than the single layer network. <coughs> yeah, why, so it's got... Lines, Sorry? The so the reason it's lines is a single neuron is input number times weights with a little nonlinearity on top, right? But basically... To make the nonlinearity positive is just a linear function. There's a, de there's a linear delineation between positive side and the zero side. So it's going to be constructed from lines. So all of this stuff is, there's not much going on in here. So it is, it is strictly lines. This, it's lines built of lines. So one side's got some slope. You're then saying, let's do slopes of slopes. So this is two layers of 24. Let's go to four layers of 12. So we're still on the same number of neurons, different numbers of weights. But let's see what this is. So this, this starts off really not knowing anything. It, it doesn't, the internals of it know nothing about images or, or whatever it's doing. It's just constructing a representation internally, which hopefully we can start to see, it, figure out what's going on. So here we're starting to get things which are more curves. And it's beginning to, if we can let this run and run and run, you'll see this turn into a fairly decent cat. And certainly, we're only on 48 neurons. Now, a decent-sized model will be 48 million new neurons. So we're not going to run that in our browser. Um, but this, and, and so, so this is a simple example. You can play this on, in any browser. Um, you don't need the virtual machine or anything like this. You can play with this, show people. It's kind of interesting. There are other images to play with. It shows the effect of having the same number of neurons, but having layers. Now, what are layers? Depth. And what is deep learning? It's depth. So, and it works surprisingly. Let me just, uh, I want to kill this. Can I go back? Excuse me. Let's kill this. Oh, no, actually, don't kill that. Where do you go? That's this one. So, so, uh, da, da, da. Okay. Back to the so this is just so. If you want to show people the presentation, it's got some images of what we're talking about. Um, this last one I let run with quite a large number of. Um, this is this is deeper and wider. This thing is beginning to understand something about beginning to understand something about shapes. Um, so, so what's going on inside? You've got these, this thing which apparently learns some kind of function. Let's see whether we can um, see what's going on inside. So first, 
we were interested in what features we're using. So for that image, we were just using coordinates and color. Um, but for sound, you'd want to use the waveform or the Fourier transform or some, some other features. Or for words, you may want to featureize these in some way. Um, then inside, you want to figure out, well, what is each neuron itself learning? I mean, it's, it's great that the whole thing learns something, but what's actually going on? And how is this converging? Um, so that's what the next thing is. So there's another example on there, which is another JavaScript thing called TensorFlow. Um, I believe there was a talk about TensorFlow this morning. This is a kind of Google simplified TensorFlow in the browser. Um, it's a nice playground example. So uh, if you open this up, you'll get something which looks like this. And if I can do that, let me open that thing. They, they're promising they're not going to break your browser. So I'm not sure it's true. Is this working? Yes, it does. Okay. Sorry, some of the... Okay, on my thing, I'm not connected to the internet. Maybe it's pulling some fonts in from somewhere, which I'll deal with. Basically, you can see that th this is a neural network. So this is on the left-hand side, there's the inputs, which it's got some features. So some of the features are left and right or up and down. Then there's another layer which has learnt slightly different features from there because it discovered, oh, I want something over, something to the right, something a bit further to the right, a bit slopey, a bit that way, a bit that way. But then combining those all together, I can make a round shape. Um, if we want to add another layer, we can do that. Replay this thing. So this is kind of an interesting... Um, you, can, you can play with this. I find it kind of entertaining to um, pick bad features because that's kind of, you want it to re-engineer out of what your mistakes have been because typ typically you think of the real world as being against you. So can it, can it survive being given easy data? Or so difficult data. So the fact that it's got just these two features is, is let's give it this last one. Even that's a bit, a bit easy. How about that? What happens here? Okay. So here it's, it's, it's learnt to distinguish the, what I would call, blue in the middle from the surroundings. And all it can do is this function with the extra bit. So it's made some mistakes at the top and the bottom, classifying these incorrectly. But that's apparently the best it can do. Um, we can try again. Gradually it will figure out how to do something. So, so this is how neural networks tend to learn. Um, it's nice that you can do this in the browser, and you can easily fiddle around with this. In fact, it's, it's interesting, it's hardly using this neuron at all. This is the one it's interested in, in having a look at. That's, this is doing most of the work. Um, but these in, you can see the internal states, what the patterns each one of these is learning. And just by doing this gradient descent trick, you can learn to do things with circles, or, or this is too easy. Okay, this is too easy. Okay. Okay. Spirals. So back in, the, back in the 90s, everyone was playing with really toy examples like this. Uh, there's, there's not enough information. Let's, let's give it a bit of help. Come on. Toy examples like this. So this is gradually going to learn something. People in the 90s were doing these toy examples and running into enormous trouble because it was so difficult to learn these internal features. And people basically abandoned neural networks for quite a long time because they couldn't make it work. Um, it proved very difficult. But then people discovered that you can do, if you have more data, the real world isn't quite as adverse as these toy examples. And suddenly there was a resurgence back in, say, 2006, then on to 2010 when people had GPUs. There's a whole bunch of interesting stuff. But basically in, after, in the mid-90s, people, most people gave up. Um, it's only now that this stuff works properly. So let's go back. Uh, 
Okay, now we're on to the big, the big deal at one half an hour. Okay. So hopefully you have VirtualBox installed. If you've got a Mac, you already do. Um, if you've copied the one gigabyte file, if anyone hasn't got the one gigabyte file, now is the time. You really need it. So um, there are keys out there. There are 13 keys in the audience. Um, I shouldn't be holding on to anything. Oh, no, no, there aren't. Now in, now in New York, all of the keys would have disappeared completely. Singapore, we're doing a lot, lot better. So that's, I should have expected that. If anyone needs a key, then they should raise their hand or whatever. Okay. So there is a, in, in the thing you've got, if you, you should want to open, let me do this. I can open, so I'm running Linux, but it doesn't really make much difference, because here is OpenBox. Here, sorry, here's VirtualBox. You on? You of all people, please. So basically you want to do a file, import appliance, sorry, import appliance, and that will then, it will want to receive the OVA and once you do that, you just say, okay, okay. Um, and you'll get something which is here, powered off. <laughs> so what we do here is we just turn it on. And basically, you'll see that this is booting. <sighs> now you discover you need it. This is booting a Fedora machine inside your machine. Um, it's completely isolated. And it will just come back to, basically, you've got a login prompt. And that's all we need. Because what we do from here is we open Jupyter. So this session of Jupyter, which is formerly known as IPython, is running from within your uh, virtual machine. And it's got a whole bunch of, well, I would say, it, a whole bunch of cool stuff um, ready to roll. So, Start virtual machine. Okay, open Jupyter. Now, if you want, if you really wanted to SSH into your machine, because working at the, on the console is terrible because it doesn't have the right keys or anything. It's, there's an SSH session on 8282. Um, user at localhost. Password is password. Um, it doesn't have to be secure because you're not exposing it anyway. Uh, and let's let's go. So what people do with um, in order to move onto bigger and bigger networks is you want to have uh, something whereby you can express what you're doing uh, better than just you know matrix multiplies or four next loops right um, you want to do this at a higher level and then having explained the neural network at a higher level you can let the machine map it onto the cores so you've got a lot of a lot of Mathematics to the machine will be doing a lot of mathematics. So if you've got a four-core machine, you want to be using all those cores. If you've got a GPU, you've got 2,000 cores. You want to be able to map your problem onto this thing. And so people use frameworks. And there's you no, know, there are I would say four big ones now. There's you know, the, it suffers from a JavaScript framework kind of problem. Everyone wants to do their own. Um, Cafe was one of the the fairly early ones. Um, it's used a lot for vision. Um, there's Torch, which has Facebook and Twitter as big supporters. Um, but t Cafe is very C++-ish. Um, Torch is, is, has kind of a Lua interface. Um, and in a way, they describe the problem precisely as they want it done. So which has an advantage in terms of efficiency, because if you know how your hardware works, you can lay it onto your hardware. However, if you want to do something really funky, um, and you'll see some funky stuff, uh, you're going to want something higher at the level than that. And that is what uh, frameworks like Theano and then TensorFlow, which is very much modeled on Theano. Um, one of the main developers of Theano worked on TensorFlow. Um, Theano is a Python library which is to, to do this um, higher level uh, descriptions of computation. And it was developed by people in Montreal and it's used very widely. 
Um, TensorFlow's just came out, come out from Google. It's, um, Theano is very much kind of ducked, taped together, um, and it works. I mean, but it, it could be better engineered in many ways. And they, I think everyone would agree that basically creating code by having print statements is probably not the right way to do it. But basically, Theano will spew out C++, it will spew out NumPy code, it will spew out CUDA, or, in fact, it will spew out OpenCL, it will do all of these things for you, um, basically constructed all from Python. Um, so basically, I know we do optimized numerical computation. What you do is you explain your whole computation as an expression tree, and then Theano will go, go, then go through the tree, optimizing pieces out. So instead of explaining, like if you say A equals B plus one, and then C equals A plus one, but you never use B again, Python will just read this through. It won't actually take out the intermediary step it doesn't need. Theano will do that. Now, a, B, and C are, could be enormous matrices. There could be all sorts of redundant computation. Um, having this kind of metaprogramming is what you should be doing for, particularly if it's C CUDA code, for instance. No one actually wants to write, not many people want to write uh, actual CUDA code for the GPU, um, but using Theano is a great way to do this, and or, and or TensorFlow. Um, since we're Python here, I'm going to talk about Theano only. Um, one other reason I'm doing that is because TensorFlow uh, was programmed at Google. The Google engineers all have great, uh, huge machines, particularly they tend to focus on good CPU and big RAM. Um, the Arno people want to focus more on the um, like reasonable machines that everyone has on their desk, unlike the Google engineers who have fantastic machines on their desk. So um, putting TensorFlow in this... Um, <coughs> I, I did att initially attempt to do TensorFlow into this virtual machine, but by the time you load any decent-sized model, you're blowing through eight gigabytes of RAM, no sweat. So um, that is so TensorFlow is all very well, and, and maybe they get the memory question under control, um, but it's not. Google, Google doesn't really care, and most of because they have the machines which just lay things out in RAM, and that's in a way it's what you want to do um, if you don't have a RAM constraint. Um, for us, much better to be doing stuff built by, built by people who are working with smaller machines. So basically, there's, there's another little workbook to do. And this is the first workbook called Theano Basics. And just in case you haven't seen um, IPython before, there is a play button at the top, which is over here. There's this play button. Now, if, if, you're, if, if you don't want to read everything, or if you want to play along, or you could just watch me, but one of the advantages of having this on your machine is you can come back to this. And there are instructions and everything. Um, so I couldn't log into the virtual machine. It, it prompts your keyboard login. Okay, there's no need to log into the machine because, because of system D. It all boots up automatically. You don't need to log in. You need to... If you started the virtual appliance and got to the, the username prompt, you can then immediately go to localhost colon 8080, and that should get you to Jupyter. Does it have a red cat lamps logo at the top? <laughs> if so, then it's, it is. <laughs> It's some debugging. So, assuming people can see what's going on, basically, I'm going to step through these cells. Um, the first thing you'll do is, is load up Theano, which. Da, 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 da. And what, how Theano works is you define, instead of defining x as being an actual number, you explain to it that x is a variable that will be a number. And then you can then manipulate. You say that, so here we're saying, y is some function of x, where x is yet, as yet unknown, um, it's another variable. But so if we actually say, well, what is y? Well, it's actually an add function, because the, the, the actual res 
the y is looking at the plus one in the up here. It's looking at the plus one because it's the head of the tree. Because the way in which you would do this function of x is you take x, you'd square it, you'd then multiply by three, you'd then add one to it, and that comes your answer. So, so if we now pretty print y, okay, well, this is not very pr pretty, but this is what I just said. This is the tree which it's manipulating. This is what it looks like oh, okay. as a graph. So, but we haven't yet evaluated y for any given x. This is just what Theano has created as a tree to, to represent what y, the computation behind y. Now, obviously, this computation could be enormously difficult, and uh, that's what it's saving us from. So if we evaluate y at x is 2, we're going to get an array, which is 13. It's hopefully a right answer. So... You saw that there was an actual, when, when I clicked go on that, there was a pause. Basically, when it was doing that pause, having constructed this tree, it was then writing out numpy functions in the appropriate connect, connected appropriately to do this. It then went away, executed numpy functions, those numpy functions on X. And I may have compiled that in C++. Um, if we told it this was GPU and it had to be on the GPU, it would have written it to the graphics card in CUDA, done it on the graphics card, pulled it back, and told you the, res the result. So this is, there's some, this is there's some cool stuff. Um, this is compiling a function. So you, not only can you just say, well, I want this simple relationship, you can say, oh, I want more complicated functions of multiple relationships. And okay, this, this is... Ah, okay. So this is telling you exactly what it's going to do. It's... Um, if you look at... Oh, <laughs> It has done something interesting here. Okay, what it what because Theano knows that you're going to have libraries installed, and it's detected that I've got a Blast library installed. It's mapped this onto a matrix multiply plus a, with a vector add, because that's what it should want to do. Because that's a very cheap operation compared to manually doing all of these things. So, because it's got control over the whole expression, it can output efficient code. So if we just keep going along a bit, we've got lots of different tensor types. We've got, we can do fun funky indexing. So, so in this sheet, there, there's a little bit more of it. You can, there's a lot of functionality in Theano, but for our needs, all we need to know is that Theano lets us do all this computation beautifully. So let me just kill this thing. So that was that. So back to so so now we've got some kind of computer machinery involved. Let's go back to one of the older examples. This is a test set from the 80s, used by the U.S. Post, I think, um, and it was originally considered quite tough. Um, and this is a training set of 50,000 images of numbers written in boxes on letters. Um, they're 28 pixels square, um, and the interesting thing is that now it's not really uh, a useful benchmark. It used to be a benchmark that people would compete on. Now it's one which you test to see. It's like the hello world of neural networks. So what you can do with this is you just take a simple network. So now we're talking about um, 784 inputs with some hidden units, and then the output is which class is in it? Am I looking at a zero? Am I looking at a one or a four? And so there's a thing called a softmax. Basically, each of these classes will vote for how much of this number am I, and you pick the top one. And there is another example of this in your virtual box. We will have a look here. So here we can just run through. This is importing a little bit more. Now, one thing I am importing here is... I'm not sure whether I mentioned it. Yes. So on top of Theano, I use a library called Lasagna, which helps with the layers. The intuition there. Um, there, are other, there are other frameworks on top of Theano. Um, I like the Lasagna one because it, it doesn't try and remove 
If you want to interact with Theano directly, you can always do that. There are some other libraries like Keras, for instance, which has a TensorFlow backend as well, which is good, except it means it's abstracted away everything so thoroughly that you don't know what you're working with anymore. So it's very difficult to get at the mechanics of it. The design is um, simple in as much as it leaves the Theano exposed. Um, yeah. da -da -da. So what we're doing here, if we go through this thing... Okay, so we th this... This thing already has the MNIST data installed, and this is 50,000 exa 50, examples, each of which the inputs is 28 by 28. Um, we can have this is what they look like. So this is these are examples of the images, and we have to find some kind of. So here is the one I've just executed. This is probably worth having a little look at. Is this is defining L. L in is a variable, which is an input layer. L out is a dense layer acting on L in with 10 units. And the nonlinearity is just is a softmax. So this is a very simple, this is, this is a very simple network. And if we just step through this, and then, okay, so, so, so now we have a network. Now we need to define what do we mean by a bad result or a good result. So we need to set up a function, which is how much do we hate this result. Now, maybe for, for this one, we want to score everything equally. Is, is it as bad to say a 1 is a 2 as a 1 is a 7? But it may be you really hate the number... Four, and you never want to mistake the number four, so you would actually have a higher weight f as a penalty. I mean, this loss function could be anything you want. Um, people tend to just choose sim simple stuff, but um, so but this thing still needs defining. You can't just assume that everyone's going to want to do it the same way. Okay. Now the neat thing in this next box, this grad equals t dot grad, is part of the secret magic, which is why you're using the, uh, these higher order things in the first place. Because this tells me that grad is the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters. So this is working out doing all the derivatives calculations simultaneously and producing an expression tree, which is another Theano expression tree, which you can evaluate in a one line. So this, this grad thing is doing something really amazing to do with the chain rule and derivatives and stuff, which makes our life so much more easy. Because then we can just say, I want to do SGD, this Lasagna updates SGD, using the gradient on the parameters with a certain learning rate. So this is, um, this tells it how to do updates. And now I will define a training function, which tells it, here are some inputs and some targets. Is, and I use the updates. It's thinking of it here. So here I'm just I'm just producing some some functions to, to help me along the way. And now I'm going to define some batches of training. Oh, okay. And finally, we can now train this thing. So executing this box you'll start to see some training appear. So you can see we've done, there's 10 epochs of training. We've got an accuracy of 91%, which is, you're basically missing one digit out of 10, which is not great. Um, but we've got a very simple network. We've just learned in our machine, right here, a, well, it's a fairly simple new network. Um, we can then say, okay, well, what do we? What have we learnt? Okay, so these are the things which it's learnt about the different digits. You can kind of see that it's doing some kind of pattern match on the digits. So each output is looking for something with a, with a hole in the middle, for instance, for zero, or three is looking for some loops. Some of it's not so clear. On the other hand, we know that ten percent of this is garbage. So um, there are some other exercises here. I'm not going to drag you through the exercises. Uh, and we can kill this. So this was just showing a fairly simple network getting like 
So let's get back to that. Okay. Now, so the very simple intuition about having these layers of network, layers of neurons, all fully connected to each other, um, gets gets old quickly. Because if you've got a large image and you want to connect every every pixel to every other pixel, um, you've got an awful lot of weights. But the reality is, if you've got an image of a cat, that pixel and this pixel have some relationship, but it isn't that different from the relationship between this stuff. And basically, you've got some kind of local property in images. So because images are organized, you've got kind of up, down, left, right, this whole thing. If I had a picture of a cat and I shifted it by a pixel, it'd still be a picture of a cat, right? So what people did is they started to apply convolutional filters, which are very much like... Uh, like a paint shop filter. So it could be a blur, it could be a sharpen, it could be that kind of thing. And the, the trick is that you're using the same filter over the entire image to give you another image. Now, you produce several of these images, and that's your kind of your next, um, that's one set. Now, because the, because the parameters are the same, you've got very few, very few of the parameters for um, defining it. So here's, here's it kind of more mathematically. You've got the picture on the left-hand side coming through a little filter to the answer. So, so this gives some kind of intuitive... Sorry, it's an intuitive explanation why people do convolutional neural networks. What you typically do is you have some convolutional layers at the front and then some, some fully connected layers at the end and then your answer. And we can have a quick look at this. with this example. So basically, we've got a lot of, a lot of the same thing, but here is... Here we have another network being defined, which is an input layer, as before, and then we reshape it from just a one-liner into a square, which is the actual picture. We then do a convolutional layer on top of this, with just... We do three different convolutions, and we then have a dense layer on top of that um, with the ten outputs. So, same stuff. This is going to say done. So how did people figure this out? Do they just get in trial? All these things? <laughs> yes. So, the, the idea of doing convolutions on pictures, I mean, Paint Shop has it. So, it's, it can't be a bad idea. And if you then talk to um, neuroscientists, they may say, well, the brain does recognize edges, so maybe edges is a good thing to recognize. And maybe it's intuitive that these pixels are not related to each other unless they form part of a cat. Right? So if you also, if you look at the brain, you can see the kind of as, as you go from your optic nerve through the brain th function, you kind of get different features that are being recognized. And, okay, this thing is going to train for a few equals. So, basically what happens is when you start training this on huge, huge numbers of images, it starts the first layer of convolutions will recognize edges, say. The second layer above those edges will recognize curves. Did you know that? Yes, because you can... We'll see. <laughs> yes. So, th this, so, above the curves, you then start to get segments and shapes. Above the segments and shapes, you start to get pieces. And so suppose it's a database of faces, you'll start to get noses or eyes. Above that, you'll start to get sections of face, and you'll be able to piece faces together. It, this all comes out of just matrix multiplies. So this is a remarkable thing, that it works. But it works. And so, and, and so that, that's not inspired... It, it's not in, people aren't doing this in multiple layers because of the brain, purely because of the brain, but it just, it seems like a reasonable thing to do. I mean, one, one thing you can think about the brain is that it, a single neuron takes um, tens of milliseconds to produce a result. So if you can react to a picture of a cat in 100 milliseconds, you've only got 10 layers you can go through. So there's a, there's a kind of constraint on how many, how deep you really want to go, um, in, in this kind of, this kind of uh, very hierarchical way. But the brain is, is doing it to some depth, 
Um, but can't we do it very deep? Okay. While I've been talking, so it's a good question. <laughs> While I've been talking, we've done five epochs of training. So this is doing something more complicated. It took a little while. But now you can see that the accuracy of training, we're at now at 98 or 97.9%. So considering these, these pictures of numbers as pictures is a win compared to pictures as just being collections of dots. Um, so let's have a quick look at what, what we have. So we've only got one layer here. So we're just saying, well, what is the um, network actually producing? Da -da -da. So this, this diagram, or well, this, this output, is we've got three output channels before the 10. So we've got one, mid, one hidden layer, which is a convolutional network. So we can actually say, well, what picture are your filters producing? And because we've got three channels, we can might as well say they're red RGB, right? So you can see that the blue stuff, when it's looking at a four, we, you can see if you, if you look at these, it tends to be looking at the underneaths of stuff. Right? And the, the, yellow, the green seems to be looking at like some... So they're, they're looking at different parts of this thing, um, different aspects. So three is kind of a whole bunch of colours jumbled together in a way that one isn't. So that's quite an easy thing to distinguish. So that this featureization, which it's done just by looking at the 50,000 numbers is intuitively reasonable, which is, is very encouraging. Because we haven't actually had to do any... Um, hard work in, in the sense of telling it how to recognize digits. We've just told it, these are pictures, here are the answers, and tell me what you want to, tell me what you, you, we don't even care what it, how it works, really. It's interesting. Okay, so, okay, so, now we're moving up in scale, and so now we move, so back, so, the, this is t taking us to the end of the 90s, now people are saying, Okay, well, what can we do? Now, now we've got Google scale data sets. We've got large clusters of computers, and suddenly people realize they shouldn't be working on toy problems. In fact, they've made the whole thing way too complicated if they just initialize these things properly, and it will work out much better. So what started to happen is that there became up a, there's a thing, I think it's an age-old competition called ImageNet, which is, um, there's a particular competition to do with ImageNet. They've got 15 million images um, in many, many categories. And the competition is recognize which out of a thousand different classes each picture is. So you can see, so here, I think each row is a different class. So I guess at the top, you've got something like soups. I, I can't see it. So you've got soups, and then you've got like hot dogs, and then you've got like ham sandwiches, hamburgers, and then you've got something I don't know. So ba basically, these are very small images, so it may not be clear what they are, unless you, know, you can see them clearly and you're human, in which case it's completely obvious what they are. But if you're a computer, this is just a collection of, you're given a collection of pixels in 15 million images and told what, what to say after each of them. So this is kind of a tough, it is surprising if it could work. And what, what tended to happen is it didn't really work very well. And there's lots of people who are doing um, image recognition without neural networks, because you can do fancy filters, you can do object placement, you can do bounding boxes, you can do all sorts of games with standard open CV kind of stuff. But then suddenly the neural network guys took over this, this um, because suddenly it started working and it took everyone by surprise. And there's no, no one is doing this. So there may be people doing image processing outside of the neural network people, but the neural people, the network people have got uh, such embarrassingly good results. And e even though we don't necessarily know how the models work um, precisely, um, or, or hardly at all. Um, so this is the problem. And well, of course, the network's got a little bit more complicated. So instead of the two-layer network, this is a network called Google on it, which was winner of the competition in 2014, or was highly placed in 2014. Um, it's got quite a few layers. Um, there's convolution, there's pooling, there's softmaxes all along the way. So this is assembling the answer in some way, and you can train this. It could be um, many days on a cluster of CPUs, but then some bright spark in a bedroom found that he could do this on his GPU, which was kind of a 
people didn't realise what powerful cards they had. So suddenly you can train this in now like a few days or a few hours with a decent GPU. Um, and you can also do it, sorry, you can train this thing. Training these things you need 50, you know, millions and millions of images, lots and lots of gradient descent because you're descending little by little. Um, but at the end of the day, you have a network with weights. So fortunately, we have another thing. So this is ImageNet with the Google Net network. And da -da. so this is a 27 megabyte parameter file, and that's in the virtual machine. And this builds a model. Now the Google Net model is kind of large, as you saw, it had many layers. Um, but it's still fairly simple. It's still a convolution, another convolution, some pooling, da, 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 layer by layer. Um, it's, so Theano is, is working away on my little laptop. Loading this thing. Come on. Now, your, your laptops probably aren't doing quite as much as mine. Okay, so th there we have the... So this is loaded, this is loaded uh, and built probably... I'm not using the... Um, GPU in my, I have a GPU in my laptop, um, a weedy GPU in my laptop. Because of the way virtual machines work, you probably can't access the GPU through the virtual machine because it's like really advanced hardware issues to get that going. So we're just using a G, uh, the CPU, and I might be able to get, I'm not sure how many CPU cores you've allowed the virtual box to, to use. Um, so it may be two, it, may, it might be four, it might be one. So I'm not sure how many I've got going here. Um, and that's, that's loaded some parameters. Um, there's, there's some kind of housekeeping in this uh, notebook to show you the, the different, um, different things. Okay, so here, here is a, an image. So there are some little test images on the disk. Um, and we can then say, well, let's prepare that image, which is pretty much the same. Okay, and then we print the classes. So this is just printing which of the, the output of this Google Net thing is 1,000 little softmax things, and it's saying, well, what, what classes this is? This is Tabby, Tabby Cat. And this is not a bad answer. Um, it's quite a good answer. So. It's been shown like thousands of, of examples of tabby cats, and it chose this one. Oh, sorry, no, it's never seen this one before. This is what it thinks. I, I pulled these off random, you'll see why. I, I pulled this off random uh, pages. So in the, your, your virtual thing, um, there's an, an images directory. You can put any, using the Jupyter thing, you can put any images you want in there and just evaluate the cell it will tell you the classes it thinks for all the images in the thing. So if you want to play around with this at home, um, it's all right there. It will just pick up the images. Um, and so here's what it says. Tabby cat, which I approve. Golf ball, less, less convinced about that. But you can see why. You can see why it's saying that. Um, and it may not actually know that there's like you no know, baby white owl. It may not be one of the classes it knows about, but it isn't making that great a choice, really. Okay. This one, it's, it doesn't know. Okay. Band-aid. No. Nipple. Um, so, yeah, you, you can do many things. Okay. Um, Siamese cat is actually quite good. Um, so, I just found some images. This is what it thought. I thought it was kind of Nice. So, this is Google Lynette, um, which is a 2014 style network, um, which is uh, which was trained you know, ex extensively on clusters of stuff. And I need to move along. Move, moving along. Sorry, just this page. So, if I just, but. Oh, I need to hurry, hurry, hurry. Excuse me. So it gets more complicated. So this is Google Exception. It's a 2015 network. This is 
little units which they're replicating, and this is deeper and deeper and deeper stuff, which is why they call this Inception. Um, in fact, we've got the Google Inception network on the, hun on the thing. Um, and what I might do is I'll just run all the sites. Has that worked? Run all, sorry. Okay, so it's, okay, but just, just, just so you can see, this is, you saw on here, that there's kind of units going across, of units of layers. This is the definition of one of those units, this inception A. There's another inception B, which is another of those units. And then you link them all together with this network thing of all these units of units of units of units of units of units. And when you do this build network, it will think for quite a while, because it's in, out of all of that stuff, it's now constructing NumPy, or if you had a GPU, it would be constructing CUDA code um, to do this, um, and off it goes. Now, I think probably, in the interest of time, we're going to come back to this. And I have no internet connection, so um, it will just see what it did. So it, it will, this thing will also go out to the internet and, and uh, find some images as well. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is on the thing. There's a fully pre-trained network. This is tens of megabytes. Um, the problem is if you use this in TensorFlow, you get a six gigabyte model. Um, Theano does do this. So this kind of the fact that I've now moved along just shows you the need for speed. And if you look at the stats, um, basically it tells you you need GPU programmers because uh, GPUs are fantastically better at this stuff than your CPU is. Um, on the other hand, they're less flexible as hardware. But, you know, and, and this is an out-of-date price, the 700. There's much, much faster things coming out from NVIDIA all the time. Um, on the other hand, Google, for their Go stuff, they've started to produce actual ASICs um, which do convolutionals. So they've got a, like an ASIC on a card like this, which will be much better power consumption per, um, per computation. Um, so that, that they've actually leapt off the um, GPU bandwagon for well-known operations. Let's just see whether this has got anywhere. Excuse me. Okay. So this is the image net on the same four images. Siamese cat, well, we thought that's pretty good. It, it knows this is a cat, for sure. So this is the top five results. Um, uh, it thinks this is a spaniel. My guess is it doesn't know anything about owls, so it can't tell you it's an owl. But it's talking about other dogs. It's talking about a poodle. I think poodle's probably a good, uh, best answer it has. Um, tabby cat. And then here it thinks it's a kind of dingo or a dog. Husky is doing, Corgi's not, anyway. So here, here is, this is an improvement of a year in, in neural network terms, um, rendered uh, simply. Um, these networks, um, you know, are pretty, are getting pretty good and they're getting better all the time. I can't get stuff on the internet, apparently, so there's, a, there's code in there to do that if you want to. So, having got this 1,000 classification, but knowing that it takes a long time to train this network, is there anything interesting to do? Is there anything you can do if you've got pictures of stuff which you don't know? What can you do? Do you want to train this from scratch? Do you have a million images of blouses? What? There are tricks you can do. So this is using... I have another example here, which we're not going to go into in the interest of time. Um, mm -hmm. And it's on the, it's, it's, it is in, your, in, in the image. Um, what you can do is you can use these networks to classify images which it doesn't know anything about. And then it will produce um, a whole collection of guesses. But you can then say, well, for this image, I actually want it to th have these whole other classes. And you can do a single like SVM classification on the output layer. 
So this is something which, which does work here, and basically, I'm calling it commerce. Um, I've, the example here is I've got a, a whole bunch of old cars and modern cars, sports cars. It doesn't know about, the image net doesn't train on that stuff, but you can tell it um, and then do an SVM classification to distinguish between modern car and classic car. And it's doing that because it, modern cars are much more angular, so it will mistake them for cranes, and, and whereas the, the classic cars are much more round, you'll mistake these for kind of wheels and, and tractors. I mean, it's, so the, the fact that it's making these mistakes is very characteristic of the type of car, and you can then do an SVM on those outputs to learn this. So this is a nice example. It's available in the machine. So there's another thing you can do. You can take one of these things and abuse the network. So not only can you get the features out of your, your images, you can tell it what features you want and see what images it produces. Um, so by maximizing the response. So you, this is known as uh, Deep Dream, which came out maybe last year. And if you look carefully at this image, you'll see that it's, it's been told that it wants animals, wants to emphasize how much animal it sees. Now this is a picture, obviously a big picture of a river. But in there, it sees lots of animals. It sees some kind of slug. Um, this, unfortunately, this is cut off. It says, careful when you search for these things, because some of these images you can't unsee. It's like, anyway. So there is a thing in, so there's an example of this. This is also in the virtual machine. Um, is a thing to do with, it's called style transfer. Um, it enables you to put in a photo of your own. Um, and then also an artist's style that you would like it done in. And it then can then match up that photo's uh, layers with the layers of the stylistic layers it, it derives from the photo, so, so from the art. And so you're, essentially what happens is, and it looks, it's pretty pretty, um, you'll get the, your photo as, as a starry night. Yeah, it's, it's kind of effective. I can't do it now, there's no time. Language processing. Okay, another thing which we can't go into now, but there's a one of the things about language processing is it's all kind of variable length. A sentence will be lots of tokens. Um, all of the stuff so far is you have an image, we have a set of stuff, set size. For variable length, what do we do? So what you do here, well, this is the trick which was invented in Europe um, called LSTMs, but in the 90s it never used to work or hardly worked at all. Now it works everywhere, um, because people can do it. Basically, you have a one unit which has an internal memory state, and you pass it over your input. Um, the fact that all the parameters, you have some desired output, you have a known input, all the parameters have some bearing on the relationship between its guess and what it should do. You can still differentiate this whole thing. I mean, there's no way you would want to differentiate this thing by hand. But because it's got a complete graph of everything it's doing, the machine will do that. Because it's differentiable, you can now minimize the error. Because you can minimize the error, you can make it improve. So this is an LSTM unit. It's complicated internals. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. The machine takes care of the mathematics of it. There is a, there's an example on, in your drive, which is of natural language. It takes weight. I'm not going to do this particularly since it takes too long to train any decent language model. I need to find a better example. Um, but basically, if you get it to read some poetry and produce poetry, it produces essentially line noise at the beginning. Then it starts to get the hang of maybe spacing and word something, but it's still rubbish. Some rubbish. Now it's getting the hang of some forming some words. This is a thousand epochs in. Um, this is... It's like larger network looking at Shakespeare's plays. Um, it actually understands that somehow that it's got to introduce the characters and it's got to have some nice spacing and it's still still rubbish. <laughs> but then this is produced one character at a time, so it's not. It doesn't understand anything about sentences or it's given no preconceptions other than Shakespeare's plays. So another thing you can do, so in the same vein, is let's take an English sentence at the bottom. And I want the French sentence at the top. And this is kind of crazy, because so this is crazily, crazy it works. So what you have at the bottom, you have 
dual LSTMs going back and forth to produce some output. And that output then suggests where the network at the top should be looking in the sentence for its next word. And so at the top, if you look at the French, if you look at the English, you've got economic growth has slowed down in recent years. In French is the strength economic is something in last years, right? So it's had to switch around the order of this thing and translate it into the best word in French and actually make all the grammar work. But it's all differentiable. Because it's differentiable, you can learn it. So if you have parallel texts, you just throw these parallel texts into this thing, you apply a graduate student, and you get a translation module. And it's, or a team of graduate students. So this is, this thing, it doesn't have to know about grammar. It, it just, it's all implicit in the text it reads. And so this is um, kind of part of the theory that getting rid of linguists makes this thing better. Because actually understanding the sentence isn't important as having more sentences. Uh, okay. This whole thing can be used for image labeling. So you've got an image, you get some output, you put it into the hidden state of this thing, and just tell me, and you say, give me some, give me words you think of. And then once you've said, okay, it may be an image of the dog catches the frisbee, the first word it might think of is for the picture, maybe the. Okay. Next, after the, what would you say? I say, oh, dog. Okay. Next word, what would you say? So one, generating one word at a time at random until it comes to the word stop, um, it generates just a spew of words. But because this is all differentiable and you've fed it just, well, you've, you've trained this first thing, um, this image net thing as well, this thing will produce captions. And that's how this captioning stuff is done. It's, it's insane that it works, but it does work. Okay. Now, on to this is a, the final example. And we're going to have to do this in 15 minutes, I'm afraid. Um, because we all need to get to the picture. So. Reinforcement learning has been one of the big, big advances. And this is an actual module which is on your, um, in the, inside the virtual machine. We're going to have to rattle through it really quite quickly. Um, Reinforcement learning is interesting because instead of having a training set with answers, the training is ongoing because every time you do something, the state of the world changes. And so you need to know what impact your actions have and, 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 and try and discover what good actions are. So if you look at Google Minds, half ago, basically they're trying to choose, okay, what is the next best move to make? And then what would my opponent do? And then, how much do I like this? Because my eventual goal is winning the game. Um, so people thought that this would take decades to get to, but it was done much more rapidly. And so Google bought DeepMind um, because they really wanted to play Go well. Or they wanted to do advertising well. So you can think of advertising as a game where I want to know whether to um, give you um, an advert for razor blades, um, for instance, and it may be that some adverts are better than others, or it may be you've seen it too much, or maybe I should challenge you with an advert for dog food. Um, the, the question is, should I be exploring your tastes and learning about your tastes, or should I be exploiting you to try and get you to click on the, the razor blade advert? There's a whole game to play with people, and you, you implicitly learn about people. Um, which is why they're interested in this stuff. So here's, here's the setup. Basically, at the top, you have an agent, which is your actor. At the bottom, you have the world. And going down the right, the actor does something, which changes the state. The state, you can observe, which is your picture, and you get a reward. Or you could do it the other way around. You make an observation of the world. You decide what to do in order to optimize your reward. So there's this whole thing which is uh, going around and around. There's no supervisor per se. You get a reward. The reward may be very delayed. So in Go, you only get a one or a minus one, basically. You either win or you don't. Um, or you, your probability falls to zero of winning. Um, but it could be hundreds of moves away. So it's very difficult to learn this over time. So this is what, there's a technique called Q-learning. And this has been around for a long time, but it didn't 
it was very difficult to learn because people couldn't learn these things. It's very difficult to train these, these functions. So basically, your Q value is an estimate of the entire future of, of life from your current state. So it could be, how much do I like being in this go position? And the reason you want to do that is because you can then say, well, if I were in this other position, how much would I like that? If I were in this other position, how much would I like that? So depending on the different actions you could perform, you can decide which is your preferred next board. You then choose that action. So you do the best action you can, and then you see what happens. Now, it may be that that wins you the game. If, if that was the last move and go and you won the game, that was a good action. And so now you want to say, well, actually, that, the move beforehand was a great position to be in because there, in that position I could make the move to win. So gradually by updating these cues, all of this stuff is one cue value relates to the next cue value. You can one thing super, one the next step supervises the previous step. Um, so you take a cue, choose an action, do it, measure reward, update it, keep going. So, but it used to be very, very difficult to think about these Q values and how to train this thing. Um, but why not make it the output of a deep neural network? You have an input, which is the state of the world. You have your output, which is your Q value. Who knows what that's going to be? And then you just train it again and again. You, you let this thing behave on your Atari game or on your Go game again and again and see what happens. And gradually, these Q values will hopefully become meaningful. So, what we have on your virtual machine is a strategy game. So, uh, rather than tackle Go in the next five minutes, we, we're setting our sights slightly lower, and let's say we're going to want to play this bubble breaker game. This is kind of like a Candy Crush. I can quickly explain the rules. Um, it starts with a full random grid. You can see that in the, in the left one, you've got an L, a red L shape. If you click on one of those, all of the reds disappear. So you, if you've got more than two together, or say if you've got two or more together, you can crush them. And as you crush them, this thing falls down. So the, or it just um, mechanically does this. And then if you crush a complete column, new columns arrive. And so you just keep going. Um, but it's game over when you've got no two things next to each other. Now this is, it, it, I like this, this is an Android game, it's free. Um, you can spend way too much time playing this. Because um, there are lots of, it is actually more strategic than you might think, because you can plan ahead which bubbles are going to arrive next to which bubbles. And you also have uncertainty arriving in, in columns from the side. So, ah, so let's go to the reinforcement learning example. And basically, I'm, so this has been written from scratch. Um, and we've done train this whole thing from scratch. Basically, uh, this numpy array is your bubble breaker field. And this is your bubble breaker board. And this is your bubble breaker board with dots in. So because of the magic of uh, Jupyter and Python as a backend and JavaScript, uh, we can now play this game. So this is, this is, I like it. So, okay, and I, I won't say I'm an expert despite the time I spent doing this. But you can see that, okay, I don't have much time. Okay, so, so the, here, you can see here, you can see sort of what I'm, I'm working at doing some of these things. It's grace, da -da -da. Okay, it's reds. Oh, the, okay, gra gradually what happens, so, but here I had a potential for doing a good thing. No, I'm screwed there at all. Trust, trust me, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> Sorry, we can, we can redo this. Tr trust me, when, when you start getting this, once you start doing the columns, you'll get new columns in. 
And this is the, I'm, this is gonna, this is a terrible um, this is terrible. Um, basically, I'm going to score like mid 500s. But that was that was not a strategic game. In in my uh, history of playing this, I can kind of I can be sure of kind of getting a thousand points, which is like a couple of screens worth. Um, but I've tried lots of techniques to, to figure this out. Anyway, let's just move along. But let's try this with a smaller board. So the smaller board works like this. Um, it's, it should be not as difficult, but I'll probably fail. Ah, there we go. There. There's a cleared column. Okay, now, now we're... Oh, it's not working here. So you can see that we're playing a, this the same game on a small board, and there's an element of planning involved. Um, and so this is not not a trivial game. Um, I, so this there has code in there. I'm happy to talk about this, whatever, um, which turns this into features. There's logic to run a game, and we're ready to train a network. And this should start training. What was your model? Sorry. What was the model? Okay, so the, what this so there is a couple of there's one interesting thing about this is that the there are five colors on this in the small board there are four colors. Now, if you just say the colors are zero for blank and one, two, three, four, um, that's actually bad features because you could actually learn more because per permuting the colors doesn't change the game. So you should be able to learn four factorial examples from every one you do. In the main game, there are five, so that's 120. This is, you want a better representation than that. So the, the, the features that I'm using are, for a given board, is I take an outline of the board, and I also say, if I shifted the board up by one, which points are the same? If I shifted across by one, which points are the same? So I do that for several different shifts. So it can it can see how connected the board is, but it doesn't know about the colours per se. So there's some okay, so there's some featureization going on there. Then I do like a couple of convolutions and a dense layer, and then one output, which is what do I think the reward is gonna be? And the reward is how many columns do I get in? So that that's the whole story. <laughs> um, but it's, if you want to know, it's, the code is right there, and I'd be happy to answer. This is, sorry, this is all on GitHub. So if you've got any, any issues, any problems, talk to me on GitHub, and, well, we'll get to that. Um, so here we are with, with this thing learning something. And you can see that it's, it's learning, it does 100 games in 22 seconds. So this takes a couple of minutes. And this starts when we do the start of this. It starts at a score. You can see that the mean score here is 214. And we're four minutes to go. <laughs> so the mean, it starts with, this is just a random network. So it will be playing just at random, um, scoring 214. This thing is now going through training and training and training. Da -da. Okay, can I train? So we're now 800, so we're training for 1,000 here. So here we've got to the final. So now you can see that the mean, so this thing has just been learning a Q value. Its mean score, which is down at the bottom, is the 384. So this thing has definitely learned to play something. It's also scored um, some decent, pretty decent scores on this little network. Um, but just because you probably want to see how it plays. So this is, 
well, you can see you can see it's way better than I was. <laughs> so this is this is a this is the network which has learnt to play this game while we've been sitting here. Um, it's not doing too badly. Yeah. Okay. So now now it's, now it's got to a failed state. Okay. Now, but let's just since we can. Oh, something's wrong. Oh, sorry, I need to re-execute cell three. So, it's all very well saying, sorry, can it do the real deal, though? Because the real deal is the one on my phone, and I want to know whether it can do that. So, I need to re because I've redefined the sizes, I need to reload the model. And here's a real board. And here it's going to do some real play. So the interesting thing is, from my perspective, that instead of doing it down in this bottom right corner, it's choosing to do it play it really near the advancing edge. Um, so that there's tactically it's something which I'd already worked out was quite a good idea. But it's also playing around with leaving stuff un undone. It has some interest. There's stuff to learn, learn about Candy Crush from what it's learnt. The, the other thing is that it's actually doing pretty well. Um, and I, I would probably say this is a better player than I am, which is, which is sad. <laughs> it's sad that I would have an opinion and it's, anyway, it's sad. So it, this was trained on the GPU um, in about five hours. Uh, obviously it would be nice to run this for longer and, and see how good it can get. Um, it's still, it's still improving after five hours. Um, it's pretty good at this game. Okay, let us. So there we go. What does AlphaGo Extra? They do some stuff with... This is learning one step at a time, so it only has a look ahead of one move. AlphaGo is looking ahead many moves. They have a tree. They have a way of looking at the right parts of the tree. They played itself a lot. And they run on 1,200 CPUs and... 106 GPUs. So there's a, there is more than we have on you know in five minutes. I can show you. So wrapping up, um, deep learning can do some cool stuff. Uh, having the tools in one place is actually good. Having a GPU is really helpful. Um, this is all on GitHub. So not only are all the notebooks on GitHub, but also the thing which constructs the virtual machine. It's all there because I want to have something where, like a Singapore originated thing whereby you can do deep learning in a workshop, in a box, handed out in keys. Hopefully some people have managed to follow along. I know it's been very fast. Um, if you like it, please star it on GitHub. That, that was, that's my uh, KPI. <laughs> so, but no, not, not for any particular reason. It would be, be wonderful to have people star it. Um, if you have any problems with it, let me know and I'll fix it up. If you have any ideas, I'd be glad to hear them. Um, questions? Apart from two minutes over. You know, oh. no. I'm, I'm, I'm not really the one to talk about that. So, um, I did finance in, in, in the CDO markets. Um, which had the great financial crisis. Um, now I want to do machine learning. <laughs> but but now, on, on the other hand, now I, I, I can choose to do to machine learning. So, so, so I, I'm, 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 I, finance was very, very exciting and fascinating and everything, and I, I have nothing bad to say about the finance stuff. Um, but the, this seems like disjoint... Um, learning to predict the stock market is probably the most difficult thing you can learn because you've got a, a crowd optimizing against you all the time. So is beating Lee Sedol is easy because you're just beating one guy. Beating the financial markets is full of noise. Data is expensive. We, for AlphaGo, they can play millions and millions of games against themselves. For the financial markets, you haven't got millions and millions of days of data because... 
And every time you use a data point, you're, 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 you should be paying for it because because um, you've lost you've lost um, subjectivity. Or, so you've lost ob objectivity by looking at data because as soon as you know something doesn't work, you know a whole bunch of models not to do. And as soon as you've done that, all the remaining models are coloured. And so I, I'm not that optimistic about deep learning for fan. Well, not that I want to stand up about it. Right. The, the it, so in some ways, it's very easy to apply badly. So I, I'm very wary for, for being machine learning for this. Even regular machine learning, I'm, I'm skeptical. On the other hand, if I'm trying to recognize speech or text, people aren't optimizing their reports against me. They're trying to communicate information. If I learn stuff from Wikipedia, it's because Wikipedians want to, me to learn it. Um, it's not like they're trying to obfuscate what they're telling me. Un unlike, say, the financial markets where people are deliberately not telling you what you should know. So this is why I like machine learning in, in a more general... Um, there's lots of stuff to do which cancer is not optimizing against my machine learning. It's just, it hasn't got time to. Whereas the financial markets in six months can optimize against me. Yes. If anyone's got a, still got a USB key and doesn't want to go to hell, then they should hang it back. So, so. So, okay, so, so one of the, my, my day job is involved in using deep learning on natural language. Um, but it's kind of, I, I, to do that, I need to understand sentences and paragraphs and entities. All this stuff, um, understanding is a very tough term. But to recognize the, the dependency tree within sentences or entities, these are doable things. But really, you're talking about a crossover between um, the fuzziness, which is language, and hard facts. And facts and rules have a kind of a different feel to them. And so this is one, one area which is very, very interesting. Uh, so this and, and kind of an advancing kind of research. So one of the interesting things about pictures is that pictures of cats tend to be stuff, you know, fairly flexible and near each other in, in, in some way. But facts are like uh, needles in haystacks. You have a correct fact, and there aren't nearby facts. It's, it's a very different kind of game you're playing. And so this is a very, very interesting thing. And it, it seems to me that the bigger AI goals is not doing this intuitive stuff like find, finding human intuition or dog intuition better and better and better until it works. You've got to, there's a meta level where you're thinking about facts and manipulating knowledge, which is a whole different game. And so I'm, I'm interested in the, the bigger game. This is just cool.